Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we are continuing our march through ancient Rome, as it were. Uh, we left off at the end of the Punic Wars last week, I believe, last time. Well, we saw that after the Punic Wars, Rome, the, 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 the phrase elbow room seems appropriate here. <laughs> those of you who know the history of World War II, that, mean, that means something. Um, I'm thinking of living that, room. that kid's no. song that's, that something oh, about yes. need a little elbow room. Elbow room, room that, yeah. Yeah, the, the kids United at States. Cornerstone did it at one point. Yeah, that so. was about manifest destiny. <laughs> yeah, continentalism and all that. That was from um, what I knew as um, Grammar Rock or uh, Schoolhouse Rock. Mm-hmm. Oh, that yeah. was that was that was a historical. You know, they went to grammar, but they also went to history. Yeah, Rome. Rome was just this big hulking thing, and and nations next door had a habit of looking at the Muscans and saying, "We're sure you're up to no good. We must attack you now." And Rome would say, "Oh no, please don't!" And then would respond and would take. You know, we're not, you know, interfering. We're just taking over. To borrow a line from Star Trek. Uh, and again, continued to cut its its handcrafted deals with each new nation. So it moved into Macedonia and, and the areas around Greece and eventually into Asia Minor. So that's that's kind of where we are in this time. The, um, the Bible does foretell the coming of Rome, but not by that name, since by the time the Old Testament closes, Rome is still barely a thing. There, I mean, there's Italy, but that's it really, no. So uh, it, it has to speak indirectly. But the indirect uh, prophecies go all the way back to the book of Numbers, the time of Moses, and the prophecy of Balaam. Balaam, having failed to curse Israel, but rather having blessed them, now turns to his host Balak and says, let me tell you what God's people will do to you in the latter days. And so latter days, the future, but specifically the messianic age that's coming. And he says this along the way, uh, I shall see him, his Messiah, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, And a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. And when he looked upon Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. And he looked on the Kenites and took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in the rock. Nevertheless, the Kenites shall be wasted until Asher, it's Assyria, shall carry thee away captive. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? And ships shall come from Kittim, that's Cyprus, and shall afflict Asher, Assyria, and shall afflict Eber, God's people, and he also shall perish forever. Ships from Kittim, or Chittim, if you want to do the, how the King James spells it out. Uh, Assyria would be the land between the two rivers, so Assyria and Babylon. And so we're looking forward to that. And they're going to, that area is going to hold predominance until the ships come from Kittim. Well, these ships are the Roman ships that were stationed there. And there is another reference to them much, much later. As we come to the end of the Old Testament, um, Daniel is being told the future of the world. And he, um, when he comes to talk about Antiochus Epiphanes, the, the Syrian king who defiles the temple and sets up the abomination that makes desolate, it says this, at the time appointed he shall return, this is Antiochus Epiphanes, and come toward the south, that is, invade Egypt. But it shall not be as the former or the latter. He's tried this before, and he's going to try it again. For ships of Kittim shall come against him, and therefore he shall be grieved and return, and have intelligence against 
um, the holy covenant, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and shall place the abomination that makes desolate. But we're told um, that there will be some resistance, which is the Maccabean revolt. So here, the same phrase, Daniel, or rather the revealing angel, is quoting from Balaam's prophecy, because the words are the same. Uh, because even in Daniel's time, Rome wasn't really a thing yet. Uh, where, where Rome existed uh, as a city, but it wasn't making itself felt and wouldn't really until this thing that's described. Roman expansion ends up placing um, ships in Cyprus uh, but still, no one's paying that much attention because the Hellenistic kingdoms are fighting among themselves, and particularly uh, Syria under the Seleucid kings, all of whom mostly were named Antiochus, of some <laughs> number, and the Egyptian kings, all of whom were named Ptolemy, Ptolemy. <laughs> of, of, of some number. Um, uh, they're... And Israel's right between these two kingdoms. And so they're sometimes they get along, but mostly they're fighting, and Israel's kind of the football that's being tossed back and forth between them. Uh, and, and so this, this is important to God's people. At that point, Rome was not important to them. Uh, India and even Greece, these, these things were not important. Was What was important was armies that might be marching through their cities any day now. And so that's where Daniel's prophecies concentrate. The king of the north, Syria, the Seleucids, uh, the king of the south, the Ptolemies, um, Egypt. And so that's where this prophecy is centering. And we're told that in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, and this puts us at about 168 BC, um, just to give us some kind of time anchor, uh, Rome is going to interfere with Syria, as Syria is trying to interfere with Egypt. From secular history, we, we have a pretty good idea of what's going on. The Pharaoh of Egypt has died, and Antiochus, who's always had his eye there, as the Seleucid kings generally did, they, you know, there's Egypt, it's the plum to be picked. King is dead, long live the little infant king. What if Antiochus goes down there and plays uncle <laughs> and, you know, Godfather says, oh, I'll help the little guy. I'm sure he'll appreciate it. He takes his army to go down there. What he didn't quite get was that the previous pharaoh had bequeathed oversight of his kingdom to this little city on the far end of the Mediterranean called Rome. And so as Antiochus moves down with his army, the Roman ambassador with his navy and army show up and confront Antiochus in the desert. And tell him, N not not yours, go home. But no, but this, but that. And finally, the Roman ambassador finds a stick and draws a circle around Antiochus and says, do not get out of that circle until you're ready to go home or you're going to talk to my army. And Antiochus fusses and fumes and goes home. And that initiates, as the prophecy said, the his war against the Jewish people. He's just frustrating. He's taken out on somebody. He's been trying to bring these Jews along and make them good Greeks, but they're being slow and stubborn. And so he says, okay, enough is enough. And does the, um, let's make circumcision, Sabbath keeping, a capital crime. Let's destroy other copies of scripture. Let's defile the temple, set up an altar to Zeus. Uh, and that provokes the Maccabean revolt, which ultimately is successful. And we've talked about that. So we won't, won't labor. But what it does do is it leaves eventually, after some fighting back and forth, it leaves the Hasmoneans, the Jewish family that normally we call Maccabeans, but that wasn't their real name, they were Hasmoneans. It leaves them in control. And so as priests and kings of this new state of Israel, they continue to reign and establish their borders and make, you know, make things good. Until two brothers come along, who can't decide who should be in charge. And that's where we'll end up eventually, because when they just, when they can't figure it out, rather than a civil war, they turn to this Roman general who's nearby and say, hey, you're a great general and you're wise and you have no vested interest in this. Come and tell us who should be king and priest of the city. And um, Pompey the Great... <laughs> Says, sure. 
<laughs> no problem. Which explains why we come to the New Testament and Rome is in charge of, of Israel. But we'll, we'll come back there. So we gotta, it we'll, reminds me of that Ape, time who? that the that some brothers who were arguing and they were like, Jesus, come sort this out. And he's like, oh. who made me a judge over you? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yes, God our Lord's, incarnate was like, yeah, no, no, work it out. <laughs> no, you figured it out on your own. But beware of covetousness. And everybody in that particular historical event could use that. So where we are then is uh, we are coming to the end. And it's slow. We're, we're at 168-ish B.C., and so we've got about 90, 100, 110 years before the republic really, really stops being a republic. It'll carry that name a little bit longer through the career of Julius Caesar to the coming of Augustus. Um, and names were important. Appearance was important. Uh, if you are familiar with um, Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, we're told that uh, Caesar was repeatedly offered the crown and repeatedly turned it down. His thinking was simple. Why? I got everything I need. <laughs> Why provoke jealousy and resentment by appearing a revolutionary? I will be the friend of the Republic rather than the king of a new empire because it's not going to change one thing except maybe keep me alive a little bit longer. Um, so that's where we're going. And um, there's two things we need to get, we need to talk about. One, the, the reasons for the decline, and two, the attempted uh, solution provided by a number of would-be reformers, or that's what they called themselves, up through and including Julius Caesar, and that reform of socialism. So, first, reasons for decline, and feel free and jump in here anywhere you want to. Um, We've talked before about God's common grace, uh, which is to say that he is good to all sorts of people. and all, He's good to all of mankind. The sun shines, the rain comes. But particularly at some time, some people just are outwardly a bit more moral than other people. And usually it's because of some overflow of special revelation. They hear the word of God. They hear the gospel. They hear about the God of Israel. They hear about Jesus. And something begins to happen. We don't know the history of Rome well enough. The ancient world is still largely a closed book for the simple reason that people who did run into the God of Israel rarely embraced him publicly. Even if they cribbed some ideas from the Old Testament, they never published footnotes that said, by the way, see Moses, the Torah, published 1445 BC by you know <laughs> Jerusalem Publishing or something. It, they, they didn't do that. And, and so it's hard to know when, uh, for instance, in this case, um, biblical thinking actually influenced Rome. Uh, it seems to have, because we looked at the 12 tables and saw that some of, the, some of the Roman laws are pretty much copied directly from the laws of Moses. Of course, secular historians would say, no, no, it's the other way around, because Moses' books really weren't written until after the time of Ezra, and that, that no. We're not going there. The Bible was written when it says it was. And so it's the original. Other people copied it. As people continue to copy it without credit and invent entire religions like Islam or Mormonism. Um, you repeat so, yourself. <laughs> uh, yes. And so, yeah, whatever the source was, we are now very far removed from it. And the Roman philosophers there weren't many because they didn't they didn't trust <laughs> philosophers philosophy is not what the romans are known for no Disposed it's more toward. like yeah it's more like people like cicero who were actually well legal philosophers i suppose lawyers and such and historians and some writers and, and such look well, back you, and, and go ahead oh there's there, there's a theory that um there's a linguistic element to that difference mm. um because Latin, of course, does not have a definite article. They don't have the word the. Mm -hmm. Greek does. <laughs> and so they can talk about the good. The. Oh, yeah. 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 Rome, yeah, you're right. It's Latin, a theory. Latin doesn't have a definite article in that sense. It has, word, it has things that can substitute, but it wouldn't come across like that. Right. It, would, it would sound rather awkward. 
Um, so we have these people like Cicero and others who are looking back to the good old days when we had family values mm -hmm. and kids <laughs> obeyed their parents and the marriages were intact. Oh, that we could only go back to that. And on through Julius Caesar and on into Augustus, there's a constant harping back to the old days and the old values and the, the need to strengthen our families and our marriages and all of that, but no basis beyond the world would be better if we did. And that's not enough to compel moral change. Uh, and so what they end up doing is a lot of quick fix socialist things that looked good on paper, but just made things a whole lot worse. And so Greece, do we see that some of that decline of the family is because of the way that Rome spread out, where initially it was much more of a it had some more family orientation as a core kind of glue that held it together. But as they expanded, they lost that? Or is there any clear reason why they that started declining at the uh, time? I, I have not heard anyone discuss it as such, but I think you're on to something. There's, there's a couple obvious things that would suggest, yeah. One, as Rome expanded... It's soldiers who were Roman citizens. That is, they actually came from the city of Rome initially. Um, were taken further and further afield for longer and longer times. They weren't home mm -hmm. to be fathers and to be dads. From their families. Yeah, they were. They yeah. It's, it was. Well, it was, and they weren't. They weren't being farmers and working at home anymore. Their job was somewhere more, else. So they didn't have a sense of the land mattering like, in the same way. Um, that's where that goes. Yeah. Um, what also happens as the empire expands is, well, well we, we're getting an empire. Call it a republic, if you will, but it now is embracing a good part of the Mediterranean world with all of the bureaucracy and the, um, the, the, the loss of we are Romans together and more of, yeah, I wasn't even born in Rome. I was born in, um, you know, Macedonia or uh, I'm a slave from Carthage or, you know, we're losing that. And as, as a result, we're, yes, as you say, we're losing our focus on being Romans who are farmers and soldiers living and dying for Rome. And our future is out there someplace. And you begin, when you get that kind of thing, you begin to play the political games. How do I succeed? It used to be you plant a better crop this year. You sweat a little more. You get your sons out there to help you. You have more sons so they can be out there to help you. Now it's um, who do you know? Who can you bribe? Who can you marry to advance your career? And by the time we're through with this more and more, uh, marriage and divorce are becoming political tools that allow people to advance. It's, there's no concept of love, romance, commitment. We're in this together forever and for the sake of Rome. It's what can I get out of this and who can I use? And in that such things, women feel left behind. They, they d dabble in affairs. Children are a luxury that no one really cares about anymore. The whole thing is beginning to fall apart. Another thing that contributes to all of this. Rome had conquered Greece, but the Romans were not deep thinkers. They didn't trust philosophy. Uh, Durant in his, uh, his book uh, says that they just distrusted philosophy as a devilish dissolver of, of doctrines or something. I forget the word. Um, and so on, on I, I, I think two occasions the Roman Senate banned all philosophers, all Greek philosophers, <laughs> kicked them out of Rome. We will have no philosophers here. As some nations would later ban lawyers. It was just like, these people are troublemakers, but they kept coming back. And the Roman people, not being great literary artists or playwrights, um, borrowed Greek stuff. And sometimes they just borrowed it and translated it because Romans didn't generally speak Greek at this point. Um, and the, the few Roman playwrights who came along looking for places, sources of inspiration, would turn to the Greeks. So Roman literature and even Roman mythology and 
plays and all of that begins to take on a Greek cast, but this is Greek in its decline. This is the Hellenistic age. They're taking Greece as it's falling apart and dissolving and, and getting lost in a sea of despair. And they're enshrining that as the stuff that's influencing them. Um, here's a, a quote from my syllabus. Greek literature questioned the reality of the gods and reduced them to comic figures. On the other hand, it introduced larger-than-life heroes who followed their own will and vision rather than the traditions of the past. Greek politics modeled autocracy and tyranny as effective and pro profitable means of government. And Greek philosophy taught the Romans individualism and skepticism. Individualism and skepticism. Yeah, you don't run a family in terms of that. Mm -hmm. And so this this is, is all uh, part of the package. Marcus Aurelius, because he he tends to be associated with Stoicism. Well, that, Stoicism lingered in Rome. He is one of the later um, okay. Roman emperors and a persecutor of Christians. I forget which number of persecution he is, but we'll get to him eventually. He's, I believe he was in charge from about 160 AD to 180 AD, okay. roughly. Uh, he's considered the end of the Pax Romana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, but Stoicism lingered, and we'll get to, we'll probably get to talking about Stoicism, Epicureanism, Cynicism, and Skepticism probably next time, or the time after, depending how long all these things take us, because it is worth stopping and looking at the philosophies that dominated the world when Jesus came. They had their birth in the early Hellenistic age, but they survived into the Roman Empire, because again, Rome was not terribly creative, and you read quotes from Marcus Aurelius. And you say, wow, that sounds like a great thing you put on a refrigerator magnet, but it really doesn't help with living. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I know a young pastor, at least he was a young pastor, I'm not sure what he's doing now, but I see his post on LinkedIn now and then, and for a while, and this is a pastor, what he would put up would be quotes from Marcus Aurelius. And I'm thinking, what are you doing if you're going to put anything up? Scripture? Augustine? Calvin? Somebody? The creeds of the church, the confessions, the catechisms, the Bible. Why in the world are you putting up Marcus Aurelius who killed your brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, I, he sounds cool. It goes well in, in a meme. Yeah, well, uh, because Rome, again, Rome was not terribly creative. And this is where we begin to see it. It's... Uh, Again, Durant says they weren't the, the Romans were not even creative enough to develop their own mythology. They basically took Greek mythology, changed the names from the Roman or the Greek gods to the gods they knew, and called it called it a day. So we we now have our own mythology. That's pretty much what the Greeks came up with because we don't have time or inclination to invent our own. They they were a very practical people, to be sure. And without the, the moral strengths of the earlier age, that practicality does what practicality usually does. How can I get power? How can I get rich? What are the most effective tools and the fastest way to get there? And that's what's bringing us um, to Julius Caesar and Pompey and Crassus. But in between there, oh, there's, one, there's at least one other thing um, about the fall of Rome, of the not the empire, but of the Republic. Slaves. We've talked about slaves before. One thing that happened as the Roman armies were out there conquering, when you conquered a people, <clears throat> you didn't just say, you didn't slaughter them all, because why? Most of them were just fighting because they were told to. They weren't out to get you, unless maybe they were Carthage. And Rome was good at, at cutting deals anyhow. So you, you have all these people, what do you do with them? Well, you can just send them home, but... You also can enslave them because, you know, your wife needs uh, a nanny or a nursemaid and you need some farmhands and whatever. And so slaves began to fill up the Roman market. And when the, when the Roman soldiers did come home, they would find, one, they've been away a long time and they probably haven't paid all their taxes on their lands. So their farms may have been sold. Or they may not have enough money to revive their farm, so they go into debt. Or they find that they're in competition with large plantation-like things 
staffed by slaves from their own conquests. Sometimes the, it was within Rome or Italy, sometimes in Sicily and other places. So slavery f- gutted the market for labor and people were left with not much. And, and, and a lot of people cashed in their, their farms and where do you go? You don't roam the countryside homeless since it's not <laughs> America in the 21st century yet. <laughs> you go to the cities and and look for something and the cities are getting Rome particularly is getting a little nervous because all these people are here some have money some don't what are we going to do with that and that bleeds us into the next section in the history of the republic and its final decline the government comes up with a brilliant solution one word socialism One of the Roman writers summed it up as bread and circus games. Let's take tax monies and use it to buy food for all of these people in Rome who don't have jobs, don't have land, don't have a future. Um, But they're still going to be restless, so let's give them something to do, something to occupy their their, their energies and to entertain them. Circus, the circus, of course, was, um, among others, the Colosseum. It was called a circus, not because there were clowns, fortunately, because <laughs> that would make it worse. But there were... <laughs> they were terrifying enough. <laughs> yes. I suddenly um, had an image of a gladiator clown. <laughs> especially terrifying. Yes, my wife would agree. Uh, circus is, is, is a circle... Um, surrounded by walls and seats and things and you throw people in there and let them fight either with each other or with wild animals eventually it became so sophisticated that the coliseum could actually be flooded enough to provide a little mini lake and rome little roman ships would go out on this little lake <laughs> And fight each other, and then the crews would fight each other. So I would watch that. Yeah, <laughs> <Let's> be real. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what's going on, and yes, it's bloody entertainment because it's what is a more and more where the appeal is. But socialism, one of the, one of the things and I, I'm kind of hinted at this: people got in debt a lot. This had always been a problem. Back to the beginning with the plebeians, when the plebeian and and patrician classes were kind of identifying themselves. The plebeians were constantly borrowing money because they never had enough. They were poor, and the the patricians more or less controlled the state monies and such. And and again, again, the plebeians would say, "We, we have no money to pay our debts. This is unfair. The government needs to fix this. And this is an ongoing thing in all of Rome's conquests only makes it worse because the soldiers come home and have nothing really, whatever spoils they got are not enough to turn things around. And they go into debt. Everybody's going into debt. And the people they're borrowing from are the upper patrician classes who do somehow seem to have lots of money. And then they turn around and they insist that their loans be paid. And of course, we're talking loans with interest. These are not the kind of charity loans that the Mosaic Law prescribed. These are these are business loans. You're making money off your brothers, your your citizen farmers who've gone to war, and they come back and they're in debt, and they can't get out of debt. And so what do you do? You turn to the government and you ask the government to do something about it. So we get a series of um, would-be reformers who come up with ideas like this. It's a pattern in ancient history yeah uh that anytime someone is referred to historically as a reformer and you're not talking about the protestant reformation (laughs) it's socialism it's (laughs) like let me just create that shortcut in your brain for you (laughs) (laughs) yeah because i mean that thank you that pretty much just summed up what i was going to do but i think you just did it uh having said that uh i was uh scrolling through i think linkedin or something and I saw a, a blast from the past of, oh, you maybe you all remember that, but I'm posting it anyway. You know, one of those things. <laughs> it's the uh, how you classify various economic political systems in terms of cows. Have you? Oh, yes. Classic. I have not seen that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it is a classic of the internet. <laughs> okay. All right. 
<laughs> but I've I've seen it before. But I've always got my copy sent to me by by red blooded capitalists. <laughs> um, this uh, so they probably have been doctored a little bit. But I looked at some of them, and it amounted to yeah the the uh, the Nazis will. I think it was the Nazis will kill you and take your cows and the the mar I, I don't remember everything that went on. Capitalists, they got the capitalists right. They'll you sell one cow, buy a bull, and start producing. But when it came to socialism, it's just it's socialism. You have two cows, you share with your neighbor. Incorrect. <laughs> uh in what universe and yeah. timeline do you live that you would even for a moment think that? No, it's that you have two cows and the government takes one of your cows takes and shares both it of with them, your neighbor. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> or it and leaves you a half a cow, which as we know is useless because now yeah, all you can do is it is not is, half the value of a living cow. <laughs> yeah. And it gives uh, the other ha the other half to some people so they can have a lunch, and it keeps the remaining one to pay its uh, officials. Um, <laughs> there, there is a little '60s classic that is dear to the heart of conspiracy theorists. It's by Gary Allen. It's called Nunder Color Conspiracy," uh, and I, I I recommend it with more than a grain of salt. Because his facts are right, his interpretation, he's a little paranoid and <laughs> a little, attributes far too much power to evil. But um, a lot of the facts, he's, he's quoting from well-documented sources in most cases. He's just not necessarily taking into, thing, in a, into uh, account things like, oh, the sovereignty of God and the power of the gospel. <laughs> Lacks a little uh, perspective. Yeah, uh, but his one of his early chapters, maybe the first one, he confronts the idea of socialism. He says, you know, if you ask the average American, you go around to, there weren't shopping malls then, but, you know, department stores or grocery stores, wherever, parking lots, <clears throat> and ask American people, will the United States ever be Marxist? And you'll get, no, I mean, it, it, I can see the appeal, but no, it's too extreme. America would never go that way. It's just, it's not an American thing. Well, what if you ask them, though, will America ever turn towards socialism? Well, you know, it's not maybe the best system, but it's kind of the way people are leaning. And I can see America adopting socialism because, you know, it takes care of the poor and things like that. So, yeah, within a generation or so, I can see America embracing socialism. He said, <laughs> do you understand? <laughs> anyway, for those of you who do not know, as Karl Marx laid out his vision for historical dialectical transformation, the next step from capitalism is not communism, it's socialism. We go from a capitalist society to a socialist society. Now, he described this as a dictatorship of the proletariat because the, the proletariat, the working class, is so oppressed by its capitalist overlords, they will one day rise up and overthrow them and probably kill them all. And they will set up a dictatorship in the name of the people for the sake of the people that will compel everyone to share equally, be nice, and not run with scissors. And yes, it's a dictatorship. And yes, people are going to be forced to share. And yes, that does mean people are going to take your stuff away. But that's okay. Because all it is is a training ground. Because then the next step, somehow, magically, the dialectical process stops. And this dictatorship of the proletariat, eventually, he does not say how long this takes, will wither away. All of these people who have had so much power will just one day realize, I'm not needed anymore. People have learned to share. People now have good hearts. People are no longer entranced with material possessions. My work here is done. I will now go home and be a farmer in the morning, a doctor in the evening, and a poet by night because everybody can do anything they want in this wonderful world where we share when everything is, we cake from everybody according to his ability and give to everyone according to his need and paradise and utopia reign until the moon falls or the sun grows cold. The the, the number of problems with this <laughs> um, is astronomical uh, and contrary to everything the Bible tells us about human nature, God's sovereignty and providence and such. And but, everything observable in history. Yeah, everything well. observable Just in cherry in, on top. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, G.K. Chesterton <laughs> said that the one doctrine in Scripture that does have empirical evidence is total depravity. 
he was onto something there. <laughs> Uh, the, perhaps the most abundant empirical <laughs> evidence. <laughs> uh, yeah, the idea. First of all, if you if, if if the world is headed toward Marxism, socialism, according to Marx, is the next place. Two, it's not where you simply share your cow. The government comes, as we said, the government comes and takes your cow and dices and slices it up, and you wait in line to get your share of what used to be your cow. And you trust the government some ways to find a bull and mate some cows, so there actually are more in the future. But why is it that the party bosses always have steak, and I always end up with a few pieces of fat and gristle? It's that that has historically been what has happened, and the idea that these people being in power want that they do it because they love us. Um, no. Um, <laughs> and two, that someday they will simply surrender this power because we have been forced to give up things so long that we no longer want them. No. I mean, you can make an argument that the, the Soviet Union fell because of rock music and blue jeans. Um, <laughs> they, the, the thing the party bosses feared was their people seeing the outside world, seeing the stuff that we had, and wanting it. They were not mm -hmm. getting, although they proclaimed that they had created paradise, they still were, were very afraid that their people, if they saw the wealth of the West, would become so enamored of it that they would cause them a lot of trouble. And so they spent a lot of time shutting all gates of information. We've talked about this a little bit before. Um, so that, that people would not know that. And yet somehow blue jeans and Volkswagens and um, rock music managed to always get across the border. And the Russian young people would would trade in fact there was one young man who financed his uh, his journey across the the communist bloc nations by selling old blue jeans <laughs> got in his volkswagen and drove and every time he ran out of money he just called some young people to go and say hey i got blue jeans anyone want to buy them and everyone would just give him tons of money because <laughs> being like the west was still cool it, the, the this this idea that we're going to give this up and not want stuff Again, there's nothing in human nature, in our track record or in scripture, that suggests this would ever happen. People are greedy, covetous, and we want what other cool people have. And unfortunately, cool is defined by they have stuff we don't have. Well, and so, therefore, every time this is attempted, you always see, as you're saying, censorship. Yeah. Um, I was thinking <clears throat> of the more modern example in uh, communist China, mm. where they're very restrictive in terms of internet and what sites you can find, what you can read. They monitor what people say, and they don't just take it down or cancel people like they would do here. Um, they actively pursue them and imprison them, kill them, those sorts of things. Because if you're going to make people think you've given them a good thing, you have to shut out all the alternatives for them to, so they don't realize, oh, wait, we are, this is supposed to be, you know, paradise on earth and it's actually, you know, living hell. Yeah. Yeah. Can I share my favorite example of Chinese oh. censorship? Oh, sure. Go sure. Xi Jinping um, resented a comparison between himself and Disney's Winnie the Pooh. Um, at one point. And so now Winnie the Pooh is not acceptable in China. And it is a sign of being part of the resistance, the, the underground. Um, it's a rebellious thing to do to post Winnie the Pooh because we all know it's a Xi Jinping. Which is hilarious because in looking for baby stuff, Winnie the Pooh is everywhere. And so I feel like Americans are inadvertently constantly mocking him just with the babies <laughs> i mean if i if i put winnie the pooh merch on my child you can be sure that it is out of malice towards you <laughs> jinping <laughs> oh well anyway we get a number of roman reformers we have tiberius gracchus who's the son the grandson rather of scipio who we've seen before he comes with some, up with some ideas, including such things as um, uh, every, let's see, he proposed a, a return to older laws that um, granted each occupant of land only 300 acres 
plus 150 acres per child. So now we're telling you how much land you can have. We are, we're generous enough to factor in the fact that you may have some boy children and we'll, we'll let you have a little bit for them, but you know, that's it. Well, and it encourage having more children if you get 150 acres per child. Well, that's, this is true. And then the rest of the land is to be divided up and given to the poor people of Rome. So let's just hand poor people, let's hand the homeless some land because of course they'll know what to do with it. Um, his um, brother follows him, and he continues his, uh, his brother's name, Gaius, and uh, he continues his brother's policies, establishes new trading colonies, uh, subsidizes wheat for the poor, extends citizenship to more people within Italy, particularly uh, the Latins. However, that doesn't go over so well, and that costs him um the, the support of the Romans, because, you know, which ethnic group are you going to favor here to stay in power? And sometimes the call is not what you might think it would be. Uh, once these two brothers are out of the way, we have two other gentlemen, Gaius uh, Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla, and they fight back and forth for who should be in charge and what reforms they're going to impose and it, it doesn't work well there are reforms insofar as they have any again are fundamentally socialists uh the the one thing that most people have heard of 73 ad we're getting really close to julius caesar now spartacus a slave who's escaped from the gladiatorial games leads a revolution of 120,000 slaves and it fails and yet Spartacus's name comes down through history, mostly due to a movie starring Kurt Douglas. But you know, that's the one thing that people might know. The slaves weren't what, wait, happy about movie? this either. It's called Spartacus. Ah, oh. dear. Spartacus. <laughs> Spartacus. It's one of those, you know, movies oh, that has one great line. I know the one line. line, but I don't actually know the movie. <laughs> I have to admit. Yeah. Um, I will not actually recommend it. I've, I've seen a good deal of it. It's, I don't like really Kirk Douglas as an actor. Um, it, it it does show some of the evils of slavery, not enough of them, but enough to say, ooh. Um, and it it ends with Spartacus on a cross, with all of his followers lining the Appian Way, dying as failures. It's not a happy movie. Um, the man, the two men who crush that revolt, and this transitions us to. Um, Julius Caesar, and this will probably be a good place to stop, were named Crassus and Pompey. These were two patricians who were able to summon political support and eventually military support to step in and be the saviors of Rome at this key moment. Uh, and having gained popularity by putting down Spartacus' slave revolt, they were able to turn around to the Senate and say, so we're in charge now, right? Uh, yeah, I guess, sir, yes, sir. And so Pompey and Crassus become consuls and set about the work of doing good things for Rome. Pompey um, starts suppressing piracy throughout the, the Mediterranean, uh, and and we'll pick up some of the other things. Crassus, um, Crassus had against him that he never really won a real military conflict. And so eventually he's going to go off to the Parthians and say, I'm going to go out there and conquer these people and make myself a name. Yeah, that doesn't work. In the meantime, this young man named Julius Caesar comes along and worms his way into this fellowship of evil or liberation or reform or, you know, perspective matters here. And so next time we will probably pick up then with the so-called first triumvirate, tri three vera or vera men. So the rule of three men. Um, and if you know that there's a first triumvirate, you can guess there's a second <laughs> one. And that's where we're going. Reminds me of the joke of time travelers being sent back and asking you know, they say they've been sent back to Egypt in the time of the Exodus. And they say, mm. oh, the river's just turned to blood. You've just had the first of your 10 plagues. And everybody goes, the first of first what? what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. First try over it next time. Great. All right. Uh, shall we have some recommendations to wrap up? Sure. All right. 
Emily? I guess I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we already mentioned very briefly in passing Shakespeare's plays, Julius Caesar and uh, Antony and Cleopatra. They are not history per se. <laughs> they are historical plays. <laughs> um, but if you read them or watch them as they are meant to be, you, Shakespeare is not meant to be read. Shakespeare is meant to be observed. Yes. Um, but if if you if you read them or watch them and follow the story, you already have a. It, it's a whole lot better than not knowing anything about these stories it's mm -hmm. it's again it's shakespeare this 17th century english play, playwright <laughs> it's not actually julius caesar saying the words it's not we don't we don't have the word for word um but it sounds really cool and you'll remember the story which is <laughs> half the battle for learning history <laughs> so i recommend shakespeare <laughs> rachel so i'm going to go very uncultured compared to that <laughs> and recommend a phone app uh, which is called Cetera uh, spelled S-E-T-E-R-R-A mm. and it is an app where you can practice your geography. It has lots of map quizzes and challenges and you can choose what part of the world you want to practice. Uh, I first came across it when I was teaching geography, but it's just a fun way if you're sitting at a doctor's office for five minutes um, to do some review on maps or maybe learn maps for the first time. Okay. Cool. Well, following kind of up on that, as someone who's getting older and tries to keep stimulating his rational processes so I don't, you know, um, dementia is scary. Uh, there are three games online that I use, and you might find them worth your time. Uh, the first one is called World Bowl. Yes, World, World Bowl. Bowl. Yes, I have which, played that. <laughs> <laughs> which um, originally was French and still is, actually. But if you, you can go find the button to switch it into English. And it will show you a map of some country in outline. And then gives you six chances to figure out what it is. And each time that you miss, it tells you which direction you need to go from where you picked and how far you need to go. So you do eventually begin to get a sense of, oh, it says I'm 500 miles away from what it actually picks. So I'm real close. It's probably the the, the nation next door. When it says, you know, 10,000 miles, okay, I'm on the wrong <laughs> side of the planet. Yeah. Um, Which is I, funny as you start to recognize like the coastal yes. patterns of like, <laughs> oh, different regions of the world. That have, there are some identifiable yeah, differences here. And, and you do it long enough. I've been doing it probably a year now. I don't know. Uh, I am beginning to get to the point of, okay, I have my favorite countries to start with. <laughs> um, I'm starting with, um, which one do I start with? Albania or something like that. <laughs> or Afghanistan, or Ivory Coast, which is a good one for Africa. But they keep, but lately they've been throwing South America at me. There are countries <laughs> in South America. When did that happen? I, um, but you do, you well, do your right. <laughs> about 1800? <laughs> yeah, and who named them? I mean, like some of them have the same name or they sound a lot like, anyway, uh, it, it, it can help you begin to recognize boundaries. The funny thing for me was the time they showed me Canada and I didn't recognize it <laughs> because it, sh it shrunk, you know, you, Canada should be big and they shrunk it down to the size of what England might look like. And oh, I'm no. thinking, <laughs> so I don't know any small country that looks like, and like, oops, <laughs> okay, it has to be shrunk. All right. But you know, when you see a boot show up, okay, well, well that's Italy mm -hmm. and some, some things you recognize, but all of the landlocked countries in Africa and in Eastern Europe down into uh, Asia and yes, some Latin American countries. It's, it's becomes for me more of a, okay, what's next door? I'll, I'll <laughs> guess one and see how close I am. If nothing else, you end up looking at maps and saying, oh, well, I didn't know that was there. So that's a good thing. <clears throat> Another one that everyone probably already knows is Wordle, and I'll just pass on that one. 
The other one is Connections. And I yes, think I may I've have recommended that this. before. Mm -hmm. uh, they give you a bunch of words and you're supposed to explain, or at least in your own mind, explain to yourself, which words are connected with which words and for what reason. And it may be that they all apply to the same field of human endeavor. This is all... Uh, these are all martinis. These are all sports <laughs> terms. These are all cartoon characters. Or the if you if you drop the last letter, these would all be. Or if you add a Y to all of these, these would all be. Or these all these are all words that sound like but aren't. Or you know, it's all, so you have to be able to look in all kinds of directions and. Um, one hopes that it jars your thinking ability and your perception of life enough that you begin to keep your mind working. So go play worthwhile games on the internet if you're going to play any. Yeah. <laughs> I like Sudoku puzzles. And yes. at one point I was staying up far too late. <laughs> Sudoku puzzles, And I uh, scrolled through a social media platform just as a break and it said girl stop playing sudoku and go to bed <laughs> i was like oh uh thank you lord <laughs> i didn't know i was needing a sign but there it is <laughs> yes. so this is right, the sign you were looking for this is the sign from god you were looking for okay yeah. <laughs> There well, we thank go. you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, big thank you to our financial supporters who keep the show rolling. We really appreciate you. Uh, thank you for listening, dear listener. Um, if you would like to send us a message, you can email us at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. And if you would like to join the ranks of our financial supporters, you can visit patreon.com slash haltingtowardsion. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we would love to receive questions, comments. I don't know that we would love to receive insults, but we'll take them. Uh, we I don't read listening. the emails. David reads the emails, <laughs> so I can say that. <laughs> he just won't tell me about them. Uh, anyhow, thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye.